how to focus and master your vision how to focus and master your vision I want to give it a, a subtitle and I want you to take notes tonight because this will be really a letter to yourself how to master your gift say that with me how to master your gift now I'm gonna give you a lot of information in a very short time how to master your gift one of the uh, the greatest causes of failure that I have studied is not identifying the objective of success in other words people fail because they don't know what they wanted to succeed in to aim at nothing they say is to hit everything and most of the people on this planet 5.7 billion of us are basically running around the earth with a loaded life aiming at nothing to aim at everything is to hit nothing and that's what is the cause of most of our frustration and our depression we know we're busy we know we're active but we're not really focusing on anything specific let me give you an example suppose I come to you and say to you let's meet and you ask me where and I answer anywhere and you ask when do you want to meet and my answer anytime when do you think we'll meet where do you think we'll meet and most of the human race are generally living that way they have no appointment with life no time to accomplish their destiny you see most of the human race are general contractors they are constructing everything and building nothing most people in the world attempt to do everything and consequently accomplish nothing I guarantee you that everybody in this room on a weekend on a Friday evening are probably tired and the question is what did you do that made you tired that took you any closer to where you wanted to go some people are busy doing unimportant things you see mediocrity is a region bounded on the north by compromise on the south by indecision and on the east by past thinking and on the west by a lack of vision and most people live in that territory called mediocrity as a matter of fact most of the human race are suffering from the problem of being general the problem with the human race is not the color of their skin but the color of their lives and I want you to make a note of this in your note most of us really don't have a problem with our pigmentation as a matter of fact whether you are black or white or brown or high yellow or whether you are pink or red or whatever color you are it really doesn't count as to whether you'll be a success or a failure you see your pigmentation is not the problem the problem is the color of your lives and that color is gray there's another color that people live in I call it beige they never seem to have a black or white life they never seem to have a, a precise way of living they're always just there many claim that their gray lives is a result of their pursuit of balance in their lives people say well I don't want to go too much on one side or the other side I don't want to really go after anything because I may miss something well what they call balance is really an excuse for not making a choice others are so indecisive that their only decision is not to decide and that's how most people live balance is not the inclusion of everything and it's not the avoidance of anything balance is usually just an excuse people use for being lukewarm people say well I don't want to really become too serious about anything because uh, you know I might miss what I really want to do and they have that excuse for 45 years and they end up being an average mediocre person balance however you can get this definition down balance is the maintenance of equilibrium while moving toward a destination I want to repeat that balance is the maintenance of equilibrium 
keeping your equilibrium on your way to a destination. Take it as an example. You ever seen a big ships on the ocean? Big boats, uh, uh, even small boats, I guess. Uh, they have the same experience. They are always wanting to maintain their balance. But wouldn't it be depressing and frustrating and perhaps even a waste of precious time and fuel for a boat to spend its whole life just balancing on the ocean? Making sure it doesn't tip over. Just for 50 years, just balancing. For 90 years in the ocean, just balancing. You see, the problem is balance is a means to an end. We say we don't want to choose anything specific in life because we got to keep balance. Well, I say to you that a boat keep balance on its way to its specific port. You got to go somewhere while you are maintaining your balance. Life was never designed to be lived in the gray. I am so sorry that so many people in the world have really worked hard and accomplished nothing. Some of you are 65 years old. Perhaps you're watching this television program as well. And you are 70 years old. All you look back on is, is what have I done with my life? Uh, what have I made as a contribution to the human race? What have I really left for the next generation to know that I was here? There's no footprint in the sand of history that looks like mine. What a tragedy. As a matter of fact, the best some people do in life after working for 60 years for a company is a pen or a clock. But I submit to you that the nature of God is purpose. And the word purpose is the same word in the Greek for intent. Everybody say intent. God is a God of purpose. He's a God of intent. He's always going somewhere and always doing something. There's nothing in this wonderful book where God is entertaining. There's no entertainment in God. There's no page on the Bible where God appears just to let people see how good he looks. As a matter of fact, every appearance of God in history was because he wanted something done and he was doing it. You see, God doesn't just show up. God acts. Most of the humans on this planet are basically showing up. God hates gray. Say that with me. God hates gray. Write that down to yourself. God hates gray. God doesn't want anybody to be gray. <laughs> Why? Because of his integrity. Now, why do I answer it that way? Gray means it's neither yes nor no. It's maybe. And Jesus had some things to say about maybe, didn't he? If you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus talks about gray living. And he was very emphatic about how he felt about it. And Jesus said he doesn't like people who can decide to decide. And most of the people in the world are basically living in this beige area of life. They're never quite on one thing all in their heart. At Mark, Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, Jesus said, Let your nay be nay and your yea be yea any more than this is what is what evil Jesus says it's evil to be in gray either you're going or coming you either up or down you either doing some more ain't doing nothing either you are heading in a direction or you are heading in another direction you can't just suspend your life and I want to say to you tonight that there are millions of people who are still not sure who they are, what they are about, what they're doing, and they are spending money, wearing clothes, and eating food. Sometimes I would say to God quietly, oh God, take that one home. I would say it, I'd say, God, that one is a waste of time. I mean, this person has no intent of doing anything with their lives. What a depressing reality. And God has invested so much in you that God hates to see you suspended. Everybody say this, get out of the air. Say, put your foot on the ground. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, is another aspect of God's hating the gray. 
God told the people in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, he says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Then he says, choose today. In other words, stop putting off and procrastinating and, 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 and hoping you get there. He said, decide whether you're going to get a curse or a blessing. Decide whether you're going to kill yourself or live. You know, some folks, I just see why God gets real upset, you know, because people, they drift in and out of holiness. Either be unholy or be holy. Be holy, holy, or holy, unholy. Be something. Decide what you're going to do with your life. Some people flirt with God. They wink with God. They hang out with God sometime when they get in trouble. Jesus has something to say about that in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. You want to hear it again? The spirit of the hatred for gray. Jesus said in Revelation 3, 15, I would that you would be cold or hot. Why? Because if you are lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus says, decide what you want to do, please. In other words, there's the nature of God coming out in these expressions. He's saying, are you going to act decisively or are you going to drift and procrastinate? James chapter 1 verse 17. I want you to read this one. I like this. It tells you the real power of the character of God concerning gray. James chapter 1 verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the father of lights with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning very important statement about God James chapter 1 verse 17 I read it again it says every good and perfect gift everybody say perfect gift everybody say good oh this is gonna really be good for you right now listen to this it says God is a God who gives gifts and when he gave a gift, he doesn't vary about the gift. When he gave you something, he don't want to see anything else. Hmm. Whatever God invested in you, he want to see that. He's a good God who gives good gifts to all men, and he doesn't vary, nor does he turn or change in his expectation. God expects to see what he gave you. He's a gift giver. You know, words that describe God's nature and character further attest to his commitment to objectivity or living either in the white or the black. Words like faithfulness. Everybody say faithfulness. Why does the word faithfulness always relate to God? It means God's going somewhere, ain't no one gonna stop it. That's what faithfulness means. Faithfulness means I'm on my way and ain't nothing gonna stop me. I'm faithful to what I decided to have. I'm faithful for what I decided to accomplish. I am faithful to what I decided to do. And most humans have not captured this character of God. How many of you changed jobs five times in the last three years? How many of you keep on changing your, your uh, decisions for what you're going to study in your major? I mean, people have no sense of focus. They keep drifting. Can I suggest to you that God hates variableness? Always varying life. Always, always doing something for some time and then doing something else i tell you this is going to be a good revelation tonight because god is going to say to you be like me another word that's like god is the word perseverance write the word down perseverance everybody say perseverance perseverance implies that i'm on my way somewhere but i have some temporary resistance and i'm still moving toward my goal perseverance implies god's objectivity because it means that it's a attitude of I won't quit you know most people change because of an experience that was negative but an objective oriented person is a person who knows that any resistance to their objectivity or their goal is always temporary if that goal is from God I suggest to you then that if you keep changing because of pressure and because of problems you will never really live the kind of life God expected you to live Another word that describes God's character is the word courageous. Everybody say courageous. Say it again, courageous. You know, courage is the ability to stand up in the face of fear. As a matter of fact, it's impossible to be courageous without fear. Fear is necessary to have courage. And if you've been afraid in your life many times, that's good. Matter of fact, if you don't have any fear, you're not really living in faith. 
Strange statement, isn't it? Faith produces fear. Why? Because faith always demands that you do something that you know you can't do. And the fear is positive. The fear gives birth to courage. If you're afraid to do it because it's so big, then God says, let your courage come to life. Courage means I'm afraid, but I'm still moving. Say it with me. I'm afraid, but I'm still moving. Come on, say it again. I'm afraid, but I'm still moving. That's courage. Without fear, there can be no courage. That's why Jesus loves for us to do the impossible. Because the impossible is possible with God. That's why your fear gives birth to courage. God told Joshua in chapter 1 of Joshua, where he, said, he says, be of good courage. Why? Joshua was scared. I tell you, another word that really makes me understand God's commitment to objectivity is the word steadfast. Everybody say steadfast. Steadfast means to stand fast or to stand steady in the face of resistance. When opposition comes, you don't turn back and go back where you've been. Opposition is supposed to strengthen your legs and to revive your stamina. That's what opposition is supposed to do. Life was designed to be lived with purpose, fueled by vision, oiled by compassion, and propelled by the offensive. I will repeat that. Life was designed to be lived with purpose. That means an intentional life. To be fueled by vision. That means you see something and you ain't going to quit till you get it. And it's oiled by compassion. That means you are careful and sensitive on your way to your goal to not hurt anybody. And then it is propelled by the offensive. The offensive means you should never live life by crisis management. An offensive life is a life that is initiating its own action. Most people do things because they have to. God wants you to do things because he decided to. Say la. So I want to challenge you to do something. Choose to be offensive. In other words, don't live on the defense. Stop living from position of an excuse as to why you can't accomplish what you were born to do. Take your life out of neutral. Come on, tell your neighbor that. Some people have been for the last 20 years just idling. What you doing? Just, just trying to make it. Where you going? Not sure yet. What you going to do? Well, I'm doing something now. Just kind of doodling. And people just have their lives with no, no, no strength of destiny. Just in neutral. Some of you being a secretary for 20 years, and you are the same increment level. Man, I tell you, you should move from a secretary to an executive secretary and from an executive secretary to an administrative assistant and from an administrative assistant to an administrator and then take your boss's job <laughs> and I'm serious a lot of folks just kind of well I got a job I just want to keep it you don't want to keep no job you want every job to put you in a track toward a goal that's bigger than its present pay this is what God is calling us to can I suggest to you that you should Settle on a, on a destination. Decide where you want to go. You know, there were two fishermen who were lost in a storm once. And they were on a lake. And the storm was blowing like crazy. They couldn't see anything. And one of the fishermen said to the, his colleague, he said, uh, we got two choices. We can pray or row. Which one should we do? And the guy answered, let's do both. You know, that's the way you need to live. You should not just be hoping things work out. You need to decide, that's the line, let's roll. And even though you're scared, keep on rolling. Get a destination while you're praying. You don't just allow life to live you. Don't allow circumstances to destroy your passion for living. You've got to have something bigger than the storm. You see, many spend a lifetime trying to change who God has made them. Because they don't know who they are in the first place. The most miserable people in the world are those who can never make a decision. You ever seen them? Matter of fact, they're the worst kind of people to be with. Where you want to eat? I don't know. What do you want to eat? Don't care. Where you want to go? Don't bother me. I mean, isn't that just angry? And some of you mad folks know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you ask your wife, what do you want? I don't know. Where you want to eat? Anything. 
They want to go. Who cares? Woman, stay home and eat. I mean, you, people, you just can't handle that when people can't make a decision. And I believe that is the way most of us live. Now, many of us, as I said in our last session, we make shopping lists before we go to the store, but make no lists for our lives. You see, indecision is deadly. Say that with me. Indecision is deadly. Say it again. Indecision is deadly. Hold your hand in the air, close your eyes. Say it to yourself. Loud. Indecision is deadly. There are too many people in this room right now who've been trying to decide to do something for the last five years, and they're still trying. You see, the most dangerous place to be is in the middle of the street. And that's where most people are. That's why life keeps running over them. I decided years ago that ain't nobody gonna tell me where and what I can do. I have decided what I'm gonna be. I have decided what I'm gonna accomplish. And I am set on that like Jesus was on his. The Bible says he set his face toward Jerusalem like Flint. Now you know Flint is the hardest rock that you can find. It says when he set his goal to go to the cross, it was too late to talk him out of it. Are you living that way? Is there something that you've decided you're going to have to, you're going to have to, to destroy yourself to try and stop me? What commitment do you have to a vision that's bigger than your life? You know, believers should have wills, not wishes. Many of you I guess just like I was, wishing things get better. No, make a decision. They must get better, and here's what I'm going to do about it. I wish I could go to college. No, sit down tomorrow and write for applications and start filling them out. I wish I could improve my, my, my weight. Well, do something about it. Don't, don't have a wish, have a will. The Bible says, whatsoever you will, that's what you end up becoming and doing. I believe that James 1.8 says it well. I want to read this from James 1.8. James says, a double-minded man is unstable in how many? All of his ways. In other words, when a person is indecisive, you can't trust them with nothing. You could tell a person who's indecisive, it shows up in everything. The way they spend their money, the way they eat, the way they act in their family, the way they commit themselves to, the, to, to uh, projects. You can't trust the person who is indecisive. Double-minded man is unstable. Most people are general characters. Not just contractors, but characters. They're just kind of there. Some people have no distinction. As a matter of fact, the only thing distinct about them is that they remind you of everybody else. What a depressing truth. You were not born nor created to do everything. Say that with me. I was not born nor created to do everything. Write that down. That's a very important statement that set me free. Say it again. I was not born to do everything. Say it again. I was not born to do everything. Come on, say it loud. Come on, talk to me. I was not born to do everything. Come on, tell your neighbor. You were not born to do everything. That sounds so simple, but most of you are breaking your neck trying. <laughs> Write this down. You were not born to meet all the needs on earth. Write this statement down. You were born and created to do something. Not everything, but something. There's something God created you to do. And that something is supposed to be your focus and your attraction. That something is supposed to be the very essence that motivates you and keep you on track. You see, the mistake most people make is thinking that the main goal of life is to stay busy. And that is a lie. The main goal of life is not to stay busy. Why? Because when you think that way, it's a trap. Busy does not equal progress. Busy does not mean you're going anywhere. You know, I was uh, in one of our stores here in the Bahamas some years ago. My son, uh, Charo, uh, he was about five years old, four or five years old. And we went to visit a store here that was a pretty big toy store. And every Christmas, everybody used to go to this store. It's, it's now, I think, changed names lately. And that store used to be the place where people went to take their kids to buy toys. 
Well, we took our son and daughter there to buy toys and, and uh, we let them kind of wander around, look at all the beautiful toys and everything. And my son saw a rocking horse. My son got on that rocking horse and I tell you what, he, I tried to get him off, he was angry. I mean, that thing was so exciting to him, he held on to the ears of the horse and he began to rock back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I tell you, we were ready to go. He was rocking back and forth, back and forth. He says, man, this is something, this is fun for him. And my son was rocking, rocking. And we went walking after our daughter and everything, looking through the store. When we came back, he was still rocking, faster and faster rocking. And after about 20 minutes, he was wet, soaking wet. I mean, he was sweating, but he was still rocking. And while I looked at him, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. The Holy Ghost said, that's how most people live. clap your hand you know it's true a lot of people everybody's at working hard sweating hard no progress he was at the same spot <laughs> for 30 minutes and he was wet think about your life think about how hard you use that precious energy you have how many years you have poured yourself out making some corporate executive rich imagine how much you have poured your life out in making other people so wealthy and then you are left with nothing you are not a rocking horse rocker tell your neighbor I'm not a rocking horse rocker tell your neighbor I'm going somewhere tell your neighbor I'm getting off this rocking horse I'm gonna find me a stallion tell your neighbor my stallion is God's vision for my life clap your hand if you understand what I'm talking about get off that rocking horse You see, many are mediocre in everything and excellent in nothing. I discovered something about the devil. The devil's most successful weapon is to get you to do a good thing instead of the right thing. As a matter of fact, he has a more dangerous weapon to get you to do many good things instead of the right thing for your life. You see, some of you think that the Satan really wants you to, to do evil, or he wants you to do sinful things, but I think he figures out now that he ain't succeeding too much. You, you, you're kind of a little wise now. You, 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 you know a little bit more about life. So he comes with you with something you don't even think about. He comes with you with, with busy, good activities rather than a single focused right. And that's why most of us end up becoming experts at everything and proficient at nothing. I am here to tell you in this session that most people are famous for nothing. <laughs> Matter of fact, there are even more people who are known for nothing. And this is the crux of the message in this session. There are others who are good for nothing. How old are you right now? Think about how old you are. Let's say you, you are 18. What have you done so far? I mean, you spend so much time trying to keep up with your friends that you never met yourself. You're 19 years old. You spend so much of those 19 years trying to please your friends, you have never pleased God or yourself. You call it peer pressure. I call it having others rule your life. You're 40 years old. Look back at your life. What have you done that the world can't forget? Famous for nothing. Renowned for nothing. Good for nothing. Tell your neighbor, he ain't talking about me, he's talking about you. Come on, tell him, he ain't talking about me, he's talking about you. Write this down. Procrastination can become a full-time occupation. That's the problem. Procrastination can become a full-time vocation. Some people are so good at procrastination, they're experts. They know how to do nothing all day. They know how to do everything that is not important all the time. They know how to avoid the real issues of life with precision. They know how to really get ahead of nothing. Procrastination. Tell your neighbor, he ain't talking to me. You see, we need to be like the apostles. Ready for this? 
the apostles when you read this great wonderful record that God left us the apostles were known for their acts not for their talk that's why it's called the acts come on somebody of the apostles they were doers they these, these are people who had a a destination and they got busy they went on a rocking horse honey they were changing the world they were they did they were changing systems. they were affecting government they were they were shaking up educational system they had nations afraid of them and towns nervous when they showed up I wonder how people feel when you show up oh here she comes in she can come with a new idea you're right don't rock the boat oh I'm gonna rock this one because we got to get some of y'all out of here y'all ain't doing nothing I mean some people just gotta you know Change don't come until somebody get mad. And change always makes the people who don't want change mad. If you're going to be what you were born to be, be known for your acts. Do something. You know, folks criticize me sometimes. I mean, most of you know that. I am usually sometimes the subject of criticism in this country for the last 25 years. When I was the visionaries, I was a demon. Now I'm Bahamas Faith Ministries, I'm a thief. I mean, but if you go behind the critics, you won't do what you were born to do. What to do with critics is just ignore them and keep on acting. Come on, somebody. You got to do something and avoid those folks who ain't doing nothing. I found out something about critics. Critics criticize because they have the time. You need to be so busy, you ain't got time to criticize nobody, and you ain't got time to listen to nobody criticizing you. That's what God wants. I like the way, was it Nehemiah who said, I ain't coming down, I'm too busy to come down. They want to call a meeting to discuss my progress. No, I'm too busy progressing for you to discuss it. Clap your hands, somebody. You got to do something with your life. Oh, I hope you feel the word of God this morning. I mean, t -t 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 tonight. This comes on in the morning in some countries, you see. Write this down. I was called to make progress, not excuses. God created you to do something, not to watch other people do it. Everybody is supposed to be doing something. I wonder why the Bible says idle hands will do mischief. That's in the Bible. That, that ain't your grandma. That's in the Bible. Bible says you ain't doing nothing, you're going to get in the way of someone who's doing it. That's why most people get run over because they're in the road. <laughs> there is one guaranteed formula for failure, and that is to try to please everybody. Say la. If you want to fail, try to make everybody happy. If you don't want to do anything with your life, try to keep everybody on your side. It's impossible for you to really focus on what you were born to do without causing some friction. Because there are people who are always in the road. Good is not always right. So you got to learn to discern the difference. You know, I guess I want to really drive home the point. Focus is the key to success. Everybody say focus. Say it loud. Focus. Say it again. Focus. You see, yes and no are the most powerful words you will ever say. Yes and no. Everybody say yes. Everybody say no. Write those two words down. These two words actually determine your destiny you offered a joint you got two answers and either answer determines your destiny you offered a, a good tall bottle of beer you got a choice the Word of God says all things are permissible for me to do and all things are open but not everything is beneficial to me so I will not be mastered by what anything I say to you friends that God wants you to learn to say yes and no with precision I found out something if you hesitate about what's wrong 
You're going to do it. I've discovered something that's even more easier to live by. Do right fast. <laughs> Come on, clap your hand. That's the truth. Just do right fast. It's, it's right. I mean, if you know things getting tough and you're losing your equilibrium, and you know things looking a little rough on you, you know, ooh, mm, run fast, then think about it. Leave your clothes and then say, I'm naked. At least you're naked by yourself. <laughs> Come on, clap. <laughs> say no fast. Say yes fast because yes and no determine your future say yes to God's priorities you know you were created to be known for something and this is the punchline I want to close with this with this with this important principle you were created to be known for something write that down I, I hope I get this through your spirit everybody was created to be known for something God created nobody to be lost in the crowd as a matter of fact, you were designed by God not to fit in, but to stand out. When I think of all the thousands of flowers, millions of species of flowers in the world, each one, they are all flowers, but each one is unique in its species. God is awesome. You look in the forest, it all looks green, but you get a little closer, every tree is different, unique. Every leaf has a different design. Why? God don't want anyone to get lost in everyone. You were designed to be known for something, something is, that is your gift. Every great accomplishment in history was paid for by someone's life. Lord have mercy. Let me say it again. Every great accomplishment in history was paid for by someone's life. You ever heard this term? That is his life's work. You know, we sometimes call it life's work, but that's exactly what it is. When a person pours their life into something, history cannot ignore them. But if you keep pouring a little bit of your life here, a little bit over here, a little bit over here, history don't know where to look for you. Come on, you all say something. I mean, there are people who just kind of trying every little thing and ain't doing nothing. He's kind of, he's trying this, he's, he's trying this. And history is saying, where was she the last five years? Where, where is he? And God don't even know where to find you. You were not born to be everything. Isn't that nice? I think this is a great revelation. As a matter of fact, the more I study the word of God, the more I realize that God appoints, anoints, and distinguishes people. God likes to call people out. Come on, say something. Is that right? God likes to call people what? Out. He don't like you to get lost. He said, Abe, come out. Moses, come out. David, come out. You guys are lost in the average. I pray tonight when you leave here and watching this television program, you will decide that that's it. That's it. I'm no longer the stooge of the world. I'm going to declare my distinction. How? By my gift. You see, Michelangelo poured his life into his work. That's why we can't get rid of him. Beethoven poured his life into his work and we can't get rid of him. Tchaikovsky poured his life into his work and his music lives forever. When I look at people like Thomas Jefferson, they say he used to spend eight, nine days locked up in one room. No wonder why we got the bug today. We can't forget, but he didn't just happen to make a mistake and create a bug. He believed that you can harness energy and it can produce light. And the guy believed it. And he says, if I believe it, I'm going to stay with it. It took him so much time. I think about Oliver Gramwell. Telephone. Aren't you glad for the telephone? And the, the guy believed that you could actually talk over distance. What a man. You know, you know why people can't really remember you? You ain't been there long enough. You keep moving. There's something that's supposed to make you unforgettable. 
talking to you, man. There's something you were born to do that the world can't ignore. And it, you know, I think about people in the, in, in the Bible. It's a great example of a, of a book that records people who did little things that the world can't forget. Just little things. Like Rahab, the prostitute. She laid her life down for some men she didn't know. She was born just to hide God's spies. Come on, somebody. And now the world is stuck with her. The woman who took her alabaster jar of ointment and put it on his head. I mean, she took a chance. It was illegal to walk into a house where men were eating. It was illegal to touch a rabbi. It was illegal to put that stuff on a man because it was embalming fluid. And the guy was still alive. But she says, ah, they got to kill me. I'm going to pour my life into this. I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to die doing this. And the Jesus said, what? She said, leave her alone. Why? What she has done will be remembered and taught everywhere the gospel is preached. You see, no matter how small the act is, if it's all your life in it, life can't forget you. I suggest to you then that you was not created to blend in, but to stand out. You were not created only to be special, but to specialize. I hope you write that down, because I want to reinforce this concept. You were not created only to be special, but to specialize. You were not born just to live. You were born to live it out. You were not created just to exist. You were created to create an existence. You were born to be a specialist. What do I mean by that? You see, the general problem with all humans is that they are generally human. They're just general humans. You know, I used to be thinking about being a part of the rat race. I discovered something about the rat race. If all the rats are in a race and you win, you are simply the big rat. I would recommend that you get out of the rat race, stop competing with the community, stop competing with society, stop trying to be like the Joneses and the Thomases and, and them other folks, stop trying to be and please everybody, step out of the race and tell them I ain't going to be no rat. I'm going to find my gift, my niche, and I'm going to make room for me by taking my gift and using it. I'm going to show you how God wants that to work. Proverbs 18 verse 16 says, a man's gift makes room for him. Say that with me. A man's gift makes room for him. Proverbs 18 16, it's a powerful verse. It says a man's gift makes room for him. There is something in everyone to make a way for them. There's something in you that God put in you that the world's supposed to make space for. Now let me just add something here very critical. The Bible does not say that a man's education makes room for him. That's why the educated people who are broke. Oh, I want to preach so bad. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. There are people who got all kinds of PhDs, and if they were so smart, how come they are still poor? You know, I was in, in a university, in a class, where they were teaching us about economics. And one segment of the class, the professor was teaching us on how to go into business and make a lot of money. Well, I sat in the class learning from the book. I read the book, the big textbook. He's talking about how to, you know, to, to deal with business and how to really, you know, work, work the stock market and all this stuff. And when he finished, I walked into him out and I said, sir, how come you know all of this and you in this class? And the car you drive, you have to get a jump. I mean, doesn't that make you nervous when people tell you how to make a million and they ain't got none? Come on, talk to me. Something's wrong somewhere. No. You see, what is wrong with us is that we have somehow swallowed this idea that education makes room for us. And our parents have reinforced it. And I am here to tell you as a parent myself that we got to change that thinking. Education is not the key to success. Don't turn your TV off. Education is not the key. If it was, 
Then all them folks in Jamaica with PhDs who can't find no job, and them folks in Guyana with two PhDs who can't find no job. And when I was in Nigeria, they got PhDs all over the world from universities in England, they can't find no job. So PhD ain't guaranteeing you nothing. Now doesn't mean education ain't important. I'm gonna show you what education is for in a minute. But education is not the key to success. Because the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says your gift is the key to your success. Your gift makes room for you in the world. And look at the last line of that verse. And it will bring you before kings. What will? Not your education, your, your gift. So if you're smart but not in your gift, you're going to be poor. If you're educated but not in your gift, you're going to be depressed, you're going to be frustrated, and you're going to be tired and retired. I tell you something, what you're doing is not really what you want to do. I know that. That's why you hate going to work Monday mornings. You know, I love working around people who know that's what they were born to do. I mean, you know, Pastor Richard and I were together today and we were looking at some plans and man, I was just feeling such an awesome spirit connection between us. Because I was feeling a, a, a man who, who understood the future. Man, I, I just can't hang around folks who, who, who just kind of existed, surviving. That's why I teach this way for the last 15 years in this ministry. I got to get you up off that seat of neutral. I'm telling you something, friends. You, you don't understand. The gift you're sitting on is loaded. And the Bible says you've got to understand that your gift is what the world makes room for. If you're smart, they don't move over. They stay right there. But when you get your gift, not only, not only do they make room for you, they pay you for it. Think about it. Any human that develops his gift will become a commodity. I'm going to say it again because I know you don't believe me. Any human, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Any human who discovers their gift and develops it will suddenly become a commodity. I'm not, I'm not kidding. <laughs> look at me like you believe me. Just look at, just look, look at me. Just, just say, yeah. Some of you are saying, yeah, you sound good, but. Let me tell you something, young people, listen to me. You, 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 you little niece. Let me tell you something. Don't do what they say will make you a lot of money. Do what you was born to do. That's where the money is. There is something in everybody that makes a way for them. You know, a gift is not something you learn. Write that down, please. A gift is not something you learn. That's why it's called a gift. A gift is something you were given. You didn't even ask for it. God says, every man has gifts from above and that God makes room for those gifts in the world, not for you, but your gift. So if you activate your gift, then you will have room in the world. No matter how big the world is, there's a room, a spot, a niche for you. But it only happens when you discover and manifest your gift. 2 Timothy verse, chapter 1 verse 6 says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift within you. Paul was writing to Timothy, a young man. Paul says, Timothy, I remind you. Everybody say remember. To stir up the gift within you. Paul said the gift is in you. But you got to remember to stir it up. Can I suggest that the gift is not something you learn, it is something that you discover and stir up. And you stir that thing up, something's going to happen. You see, the mystery of multi-gifts, let me talk about that for a few seconds. Some of you say, well, uh, Pastor Miles, I have so many gifts, I don't know which one I'm supposed to use. And some of you think you're so gifted, you don't want to do none. But I have come to this seminar tonight just to talk to you, the confused ones. Well, I, I've got music, I like art, I like to write, I like to dance, I like to sing. I don't know, God just messed me up. 
People say that. So I, I'm going to do all of them. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever seen anybody who became successful in life by doing everything? Just think Helen Keller, Martin Luther King, John Kennedy, Corey Ten Boom, Apostle Paul, Peter. I mean, just call some names. Get any? Rosa Parks. I mean, people, they did something real good. And that thing became the source of their life and their prosperity. It made room. Paul's gift took him to Agrippa. I tell you, don't be a general contractor. Decide that even though you have many gifts, they are good at many things, people like that, but they have a problem knowing which gift to concentrate on. I don't think that you got a monopoly on that. I'm that kind of person. I'm a painter. I'm a musician. I'm a teacher. I'm a writer. I'm a speaker. I'm a preacher. I can write music. I can produce it. I can play it. I can paint pictures. I got some pictures in countries and people walls right now. I give it to them free. I'm so sorry if I gave it to them free now. It cost me some I want to take it back right now. I can sculpt. I can do all that stuff. But you see, I found out something. If you try to do everything, you'll end up doing nothing.